Uh, if you have your Bibles, we are going to be in the New Testament. We are going to be in Matthew and Luke today. So that is where we're going to end. Uh, in the New Testament, it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that's where we'll be heading this morning. And I just wanted to first start out with prayer. Big day today can be bringing some anxiety to our hearts, possibly? Nah, it's all right. You're good. Thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate your efforts. Um, so just as we sang this morning, how great is our God. May we remember today that tomorrow morning, he is still our God. He is sovereign. He is in control as he is today, as he was yesterday, today, and forever. Our God is on the throne, ladies. May our hearts rest in that truth. We don't know what tomorrow will bring or what that will mean for our lives from here on out, how it will look different, but we do know that God is in control, and it is in him who we place our trust and our faith. Yes? Amen? Let's take a deep breath then, and let's just go to him really um, this morning. Our great God and Father, we praise your holy name. We worship you as the sovereign Lord and the ruler of all. We are grateful that we have your word to remind us, your spirit to quicken our souls, to remind us that you are in control. Would you speak to us now through your word, Father? We are grateful for it. Transform our lives this morning. In Christ's name, amen. So this lesson, if I'm honest, this was quite challenging to me. Conflict in relationships. Woohoo! Thank you, Cheryl, for letting me ch yeah, have this one. Not the fun one. She's come into the water, it's warm, you know. Mine is trouble, trouble. But it's all right, it's all right. Just did a lot of stirring, stirring of the waters as it led me to remind me of some of the challenges that I have walked through, some of the pain that um, I've experienced in friendships that I would rather not think about, frankly. It's wounded my soul, hurt my heart. But here's the truth. The Lord has things to teach me. The Lord has a lot of refining to do in this one right here. And I am guessing that possibly that may be the same for some of you. That this may have brought up some feelings that you'd rather forget. But even though it's difficult, and those are painful things, Here's the thing, if it makes me more like Christ, this refining, I want that, don't you? We want that. So let's go ahead and, and look at these truths here in Scripture today, and may we look at it and ask the Lord to touch our hearts and to, to make us more like Christ as we look at conflicts in relationships. We're going to be covering today conflicts, but I really wanted it to be about our hearts because I think that's really what it's about. So we're going to be talking today about contentment of heart, forgiveness of heart, and newness of heart, and how those things relate because they all affect our friendships in one way or another, for good or for bad. And this contentment of heart, contentment, it's a place I think that we all want to sit, don't we? It sounds so peaceful and free. So why don't we go there more often? Why don't we live in that place? I think it's because we spend too much time looking around instead of looking up. 
And I will tell you now that as our hearts get further and further away from contentment, I think this ugly thing creeps in called comparison. And here's what I know to be true about this comparison. When we're in our circle of friends and things are going well and we're looking around and then we start looking, hey, look what she has. Hey, look at the way her child obeyed her when she called them. Look at how nice her husband just brought her flowers. Look at how she's going out to lunch with all her fun friends. Look at her beautiful home. They just got a new car. It could go on and on and on, couldn't it? And on and on and on. This comparison will kill contentment faster than you can say, she's so lucky. I wish I had. And we need a true core friend who will come alongside us and bring us back and remind us, look up. I have such a friend. A few years ago, I don't know how many, let's just say that it's really, really far away. Um, I went through what I called my season of discontent. It, it, was, uh, it was not necessarily in my habit that I looked at people and wanted this or that, and I was able to be happy for them. And, and, but at this one time in my life, I just, I was just not happy with the way things were in my life, in my home, with what we had, with Kevin, with the kids, just the whole shoot and match. And then one of my friends, who I so enjoyed in this nice sphere of my friendship, they bought a new house. It was beautiful. She had so much space. It was gorgeous, and I just felt this thing in my heart. It was ugly. I couldn't even be happy. I wasn't even happy for her. Our kids played together all the time. I couldn't even be happy for her. And I started looking, and I was frustrated. And then I, I started to take that out on Kevin and thinking, well, why, why don't we have more? What about this? This would make our life so much easier. This would be better. Why don't I? I'm telling you, it went to places that I, I don't even know. How embarrassing to even have to say this out loud to you all. My heart was so ugly. And I was talking to one of my girlfriends from California, one of my deep, deep friends. We had gone through hell and back together. This was the friend who, with some of the stuff in her life, she would come and I would just hold her head in my lap while she sobbed and I just cried with her. This was my friend who would come over at 10 o'clock at night and I would have mounds of socks that were not paired together. And she would sit on the sofa with me, and she would pair socks with me for all the six pairs of feet in our home while we talked. And we were on the phone, and I was telling her, I'm just, you, you wouldn't believe it, and this house is so lovely, and I'm so frustrated that, that I don't have this, and that this isn't going right, and everything. And she was quiet for a moment. And then she said, Julie, I'm so sorry, friend, but I, I cannot go down that road with you. She said, I just got back from helping some families um, with Hurricane Katrina, who lost everything. She said, I have been in your home. I prayed with you for your home when you were looking for it. You have a lovely home. And you are being so ungrateful and forgetting, forgetting the goodness of God that he has brought to your life. 
She said, you want a, a bigger house, a better house? Go get a job. She goes, but I believe from all the time that we've been spending together is that one of your heart's desire was that you would be able to stay home with your children. Your kids are all in high school now. And the Lord has granted you that great desire of your heart. She said, you're not a victim here. If you want that, go get it. But I think you would have to give up the things that meant most to your heart. And I think you would be chasing after things that would chase you and keep you away from our great God. And I cannot, I cannot go there with you. I was very quiet. She said, are you there? I said, yeah, I'm here. Apparently, I should have called a few weeks earlier before you went on your trip. But my heart was cut to the core because she spoke the truth of God. And she spoke it in love because she loved me so much. And she didn't want to see me go away from the Lord. She didn't want to see me go down that path of bitterness and self-pity and hardness of heart. It's too important that we stay on the path with our great God, that our hearts are filled with gratitude and not selfishness. It took a true friend to speak that truth into my life without worrying about whether our relationship would fall apart because she knew that we had the strength to keep it together. Truth in love. Matthew tells us, Matthew 12, um, actually I like the Luke one better, which is what I have up there. Luke tells us, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What was in my heart, you could tell by what was coming out of my mouth. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, he says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. Learned, circle it. Learn to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry and having both abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This particular verse, this I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is coming back to talking about the secret of contentment. It is always Jesus. It is always going back to him. He changes our hearts. What's filling your heart today, friends? What is the overflow of your heart? The words that you are speaking. Will you turn your eyes upward to our great God and Father? Ask him today to give you a grateful heart, to remind us of the goodness that we have, that he has given us. It is all from his hand. Because when our heart is free from that ugly comparison and discontent, we are free to love. We are free to go and serve. My friend that bought that house called me not a week later, and she said, Julie, I'm just so bad at this. Can you help me to come and, and organize my kitchen cupboards? She said, I've got so many, and I've got extra space, and I can't even fill them all, and I don't know where to put everything. Oh. But I've been praying and praying, and I said, I would be delighted to come and help you. The Lord changed. Was I delighted every moment? No. They had those moments when I was in there saying, ah, oh, I could use this cupboard space. I could fill this up. And then I would say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to rejoice with her and walk alongside of her. I want my heart to be free to love. That's what we are looking for here in this heart of contentment from our great God. It's his power in us that changes us. 
We want to go into our forgiveness of our heart. We want our heart to be forgiving and merciful. But this part is so hard. It is so hard. When we are wronged, when we are snubbed, when we are treated poorly or misunderstood, our feelings are hurt. Maybe our pride is hurt. We are wounded people. Sometimes we feel so exposed. And it's so easy to let our feelings take over and react to the pain, to not watch our words, to lash out, or maybe we don't speak at all. And we give the cold shoulder or the silent treatment. When we were talking about, uh, in one of our other lessons, about what traits have, have, you maybe, have maybe been passed on to you, and this was one that the women in my family mastered, a silent treatment. I remember my grandmother could go for so long without talking to somebody who she was angry with, and my mother the same, even in our home. And I remember when Kevin and I started out, and that's the way I would just stop talking to him. And he was like, what? what's going on? I, like, it's been a day. Are you, are you not going to talk with me? And, and then I had this thing inside of me where I was like, well, I don't know. Do I talk and explain or do I keep being silent? I'm not quite sure where to go with this. And, and as we talked, and he brought some things out from my past. And we came to an agreement where I said, you know, but sometimes I do. I need to be quiet. And he said, all right, well, then let's at least set up a reasonable time. It's the morning. Can you say by 2 that we could have a conversation by dinner? And you're laughing, but it's true. This is what uh, we, we did. Because I realized, I don't want to pass this on to my girls. I don't want my girls to be good at this. I don't want my boys to be good at this. I don't want to be good at this anymore. But woundedness can bring out so many different ways that we react, right? And our hearts run the risk of having roots of bitterness entwined into them. And when roots get into something, they get it all entwined, and it like sucks the life right out, suffocates it, strangles it. I don't want to live with a strangled heart. So how do we do this? Jesus is our strength, remember, as Paul said. Jesus. So what did he do? Luke, we're in Luke chapter 23, if you could go there. Luke 23, verses 33 to 37. This is the crucifixion. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Verse 34, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garment among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is God. Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In the midst of all of this, what had already happened, a great betrayal, his beating, his crown of thorns, what were Christ's words? What were they? In verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is the heart of our great forgiving God. 
He sees more. He sees the needs. He sees the love and compassion. He sees what is behind. Even in the midst, it's still going on. Because he said, Father, forgive them. They were not just all, oh my gosh, yes, forgive us. We'll stop. It continued to the end, to today. When we forget who our great God is. We don't want the roots to take, to, to strangle out the life of our heart, ladies. Father, forgive them. The story about forgiveness is in Matthew. Matthew 18. And there are parts of this that will be on the screen. Parts I'm going to read to you. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. This is Peter coming up to Jesus. And he says to him in verse 21, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Sounds like a lot for a repeat offender, don't you think? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And then he tells a story. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me. I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I have had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Painful words. Scary words. Ladies, this slave who owed his master a million dollars, wages he couldn't even pay in multiple lifetimes beyond his, his ability to pay. And he pleads, have mercy on me. Moved with compassion. He's given mercy. And he turns around. He turns around and he goes out. It says right there, quickly. But the slave went out and found somebody who owed him a pittance in comparison, and is choking him, demanding this pittance. I think what the Lord wants to tell us here is God has given us so much forgiveness, more than we could ever pay in a thousand lifetimes. He has forgiven it all. He has brought us in relationship with him. We are free. We no longer owe the debt. That 
huge burden is shoved off of us because of the mercy of our great God. And yet, sometimes we are so badly wounded that we focus on the pain that has been caused us. And it's valid. But God is saying, don't forget what has been given you, the kindness and the mercy and the forgiveness that has been extended to you. Revel in that. Glory in that. Think on that. Ask me to soften your heart with that truth and goodness that you may be able to see others with my eyes of compassion and mercy. We don't always know what's going on behind the scenes. I'm not trying to say it's okay. I'm trying to say that we still need to forgive. In comparison to what our God has lavished upon us, piles and piles and piles of mercy and compassion and forgiveness, what we as a human being, what has been done to us, and what we are even able to offer is so small. But we are called to do it so that our hearts don't become hard and bitter and we stay open to the goodness and greatness of our great God. I've been wounded, too. A season where I had a, a, a little misunderstanding and a woman handled it the way I would. She didn't talk to me for over a month. I recognized that. And I wasn't wrong. But I prayed, Lord, what, what part could have I had had? Did, did I do something wrong? Just show me. And then I thought, the only way I'm going to get rid of this yuckiness, because every time I thought about her, I just was like, but, but, and why aren't you hearing me out? And what about this? And, and what about our track record? And is that just shot? All these things. I was in turmoil. And the Lord whispered, pray for her. And I jerked my head and said, what? Pray for her. It went really slow at first. But I did. And I prayed just that he would show her his great love, that she would feel his love. And then I just started praying for her more and more and more. And by the time we actually had a conversation, my heart was soft. And I wanted to hear her. And I wanted to apologize for the things that I had said, whether deliberately or intentionally or how it was taken. Still to this day, it brings back a little, uh, when this is coming up. So I've been praying for her again praying that God would give his favor on her life, that whatever she is going through with her children or her family, I don't know, that he would bring grace, forgiveness. Ladies, we have been forgiven so much. Have you received God's forgiveness for your sins? Do you know how great it is I mean, how great your debt was and how great the forgiveness is that came to you? Would you ask the Lord to remind that to you, to give that, to stir your heart and your soul, to love him more, and to give you the eyes, his eyes and heart toward those who hurt us in our spheres, that they could be repaired? Or if they're not, that as we walk away maybe from that relationship or it just kind of diminishes on its own, as this one did. But if I were to see her again, she were to walk in here right now, I would be able to say, hello, how are you? I hope all is well. This is 
but I just wanted you to know that it still comes up and I still need to turn that over to him. God wants our hearts to be free from the roots of bitterness and anger and hate. Ladies, we are forgiven. We are free. We have new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken residence up in our hearts. If you have Christ and you have a new master, your heart has a new master. This is our newness of heart. Our newness of heart. It is all new, ladies, with Christ. I want to read this to you, Luke 24. We're just a little bit further now, Luke 24. 36 to 53, this is after the crucifixion. This is the resurrection. We're in 2436. And while they were telling these things, they were talking amongst themselves. They were start, he, he himself stood in their midst. This is Jesus coming back from the dead. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling, he said, have you anything to eat? So that, he could, so that he could show them that he was real. But I love that part in verse 41. And while they still not could believe it for joy and were marveling, they were joyful and marveling. They had been devastated and they see their God and he is alive and they are joyful and marveling. And he tells them, Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high, from the Holy Spirit. And verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. God. The resurrection changed everything. Ladies, it turns our darkness, it turns our heaviness, it turns all of that into great joy because we serve a living God. We have a new heart. Ladies, when we are trying to forgive, when we are desiring that, we are not trying to bring this dead, sinful person back to life in the sense that we're trying to fix them. That person is dead. Christ died for those sins and that person, and we are a new creation in him. We are new. We have new hearts. And with Christ's resurrection, he threw the door open to heaven and to all the promises and the possibility of the newness. This is what we are to live in, this newness of heart. Not trying to take that old person, bring it up, and then fix them. That person is dead. We are new. Christ has given us new life. We are to walk in this new way. That is our hope. That is our hope. And we're going to end with this today. Because it is our only hope with peace with God and with our relationships, ladies. That the Lord might bless us with a heart that is content in him, content in Christ, with a heart that forgives just like our Lord did, with that new 
newness of heart that rejoices and hopes in the living Christ, that he has been raised for the, from the dead, and that you and I, he has breathed his saving breath of life into you. Through him, we can do all those things. Be a contented heart, a forgiving heart. Revel in our newness of heart. Luke 1 76 to 79, and I just want to end here. This is Zacharias, and he's actually talking and prophesying about his son, John the Baptist, who is going to be born. So these are words that he is saying about John the Baptist, but through what John will do, what Christ is going to do. So we're in verse 75. And he says, and you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. That's John. For you will go before the Lord and prepare his ways to give his people. This is what he's doing. What are his ways? This is to go and prepare God's ways, which is to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. That's you and me, that we would know that salvation 78, underline it. Because, why? Because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us. That's Jesus. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's our great God, ladies. Why? Why did he send out salvation and forgiveness? Did you hear it? Because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high, that's Jesus Christ, ladies. He is the sunrise. Can you feel it? Can you feel him warming your soul? Can you feel him melting your hard heart? Disengaging those bitter roots? This is our sunrise, Jesus Christ, who visited us on earth, to shine upon those who sit in the darkness and the shadow of death. That was you, that was me. But the sun, the sunshine of Christ, the light of the world, comes to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace with God, and therefore, peace with others. This is just so beautiful. And I pray that you can feel the light of your God, Jesus Christ, as he shines upon us. There is no darkness in him. He dispels the darkness and brings the light of salvations to our souls. Oh Lord, may the truth, may this truth bring joy to our souls and hope to our hearts. May we worship you and live the new life with great joy, continually praising you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and may we never be the same. Amen.